Over the past several months, the ABC 10 weather impact team traveled across California, uncovering why some of the state's most popular lakes are dying. Warming temperatures and a changing climate are giving algae and bacteria the upper hand. ABC 10 chief meteorologist Monica Woods joins us with part two of this four part investigation into California's dying lake. Well, Becca, Clear Lake is the largest freshwater lake that lies wholly in California. It is also the oldest warm water lake in North America, forming over half a million years ago. But those ancient waters and surrounding shores hide a dangerous element that could suffocate this treasure. The love for Clear Lake runs deep for longtime resident and business owner Debbie Clark. I've been coming here since I think I was three. As soon as Memorial Weekend started, that's when it would go from 1,000 people to 15,000 people in one weekend. Since then, the population in Lake County has more than tripled, but Debbie says it still feels like a close-knit community. It just seems like everybody wants to help each other out. It's a very small place. One neighbor even working on revitalizing an old boat slip with hopes of making this a place to swim and fish if he can find a way to keep out a dangerous bacteria growth. Now you can see some of the cyanobacteria over by the docks, right where the, uh -huh. where the garden was, and the wind had come in and blew some of that in. That wind on the north side of the lake also stirring up sediment containing phosphorus, which promotes the bacterial blooms. The cyanobacteria basically form originally at one end of the lake where the phosphorus is hot, it moved down to this end of the lake because of the winds. When they die, they release, release the phosphorus down here. This weather pattern, along with Clear Lake's geographic history, create a perfect breeding environment for harmful bacteria. The lake was shaped over a period of almost two million years from faulting, tilting, erosion, and even volcanism. Mount Kanaktai is still standing high as a reminder of this ancient activity. Eruptions from this ring of volcanoes deposited high amounts of phosphorus near the lake. It's 10 times higher than the phosphorus in the average of the rest of the United States. So now we have high phosphorus soils in certain areas of the county. When you get rainstorms, it washes off into the lake. The combination of elevated phosphorus levels and high temperatures reduces the oxygen in the lake, giving cyanobacteria an opportunity to grow and the upper hand over fish and other organisms. Some of the ways to treat this bacteria, at least on the south side of the lake, is to inject it with oxygen or put on a chemical that would keep the phosphate from coming to the surface. The other option, Head to where it all begins, at the north side of the lake. Martin Duncan is a Pomo tribal member and has a long history here. Bloody Island, a massacre that happened in 1850, and uh, my great-great, uh, call her Nika, my great-great-grandma, she was a survivor of that. Hiding in the tule weeds until she thought it was safe to come out. Over the years, those tules were removed along with precious floodplains that helped keep the lake in a natural balance. Decades later, Martin is now working to replant those tules and the lake's natural ecosystem. Tule's life to me. If it wasn't for them sacrificing their life, I wouldn't be here. This, along with work to restore the floodplain, is work the Robinson Rancheria Environmental Center is hoping will reduce unhealthy runoff by integrating native practices with Western science. The on-the-job stuff that I learned from tribal members really helped me kind of connect Western science with cultural practices and it made things much clearer when it comes to management and like trying to advocate for different policies. But Luis says applying this practice to Clear Lake is challenging. Because of my kind of Western science background and being able to work for the state and the feds at different levels, you could kind of just tie everything together. Making arguments to fund conservation and restoration efforts despite the disconnect between tribal, county, state, and federal policies. In part by having elected officials that are also tribal members to help bridge the gap. I got to go to the Office of Tribal Governments for California where Governor Newsom was right there. 
As a supervisor, I don't get to have that opportunity to be in the room with him at times. EJ also serves on a National Advisory Committee for the Environmental Protection Agency, another way to connect government and Native communities. Those connections helping to push forward efforts like the Middle Creek Restoration Project. That provides so much for this uh, habitat ecosystem. It is an area where you can have a marshland so that that way it collects the sediment and all the nutrient load that comes from the hills and whatnot that runs off into the creeks. From native practices and putting more voices at the table. I think more so than before, there's progress. To Western science. With a little bit of teasing here and learning how to treat this lake, I believe actually, because I want to believe it, that we can clear this up within just a few decades. It's going to be something. I'm hoping, I'm hopeful. A community buy-in to keep Clear Lake clear. Wow, Monica, you can really hear how this community is fighting for a pathway toward a healthy lake. Yeah, and the state is also helping create the Blue Ribbon Committee. That includes tribes, Lake County, UC Davis, and the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. It's part of the state's ongoing investment in the lake that includes millions of dollars in contracts with UC Davis, voter-approved bonds, and a bond-funded investment in the Middle Creek Restoration Project that you just heard EJ talk about. Yeah, and Monica, tomorrow night, and to the point, it's 630 meteorologist Brendan Minchef travels to Lake Tahoe. Watch part three of California's dying lakes tomorrow on to the point at 630.